Monica. Hello, Sarah. Why do I always say it like that? <laughs> I'm always like, hello, Oliver Twist. Or <laughs> That's a great greeting. That's a great way to greet somebody in an yeah. Oliver Twist accent. So um, how's it going in Nashville? Uh, Nashville is doing pretty good. It's rainy right now. Very overcast. I think, we sent, I think we sent you that rain from New Orleans. So guess what today is? Um, an anniversary of some sort? No, it's the second to last episode of our podcast. <laughs> That's crazy. It's mm -hmm. And it's especially, it feels especially momentous that we're at the second to last, aka penultimate episode. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> using word. my vocab words. Um, That's a GRE word. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, because we had started this at the beginning of the year, season two, and had a giant pause because of the pandemic. And then we like brought it back. So it feels even more of an achievement to get to this point. Because I know. We've, we've slogged through a lot of tundra, like just not even cold, but it was hot. But you know what I mean? Like just... <laughs> The feeling of it was a tundra. It was like the a hot, emotional. It was tone. a hot tundra. It was a blazing hot tundra. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that was March, April, May, or when did we? I June. I back. think we started back up in July. I feel very proud that this season has weathered that storm. And <laughs> let's you know. keep let's keep all of those metaphors going. <laughs> I'm trying to make this thematic, V. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see how much we can bring up weather in this episode. Okay, done. Challenge right. accepted. Okay. Okay, so it's the final episode. Uh, no, it's not. I mean, oh my God. <laughs> Got a little overexcited there. <laughs> I'm trying to find a weather metaphor for that. <laughs> um, it's the penultimate episode. And okay. so we're, we've, we've brought it back from the um, icy break. And we're also bringing it back in a different way for this episode because we're going to talk a little bit about art heists again because it's 2020 and we can do what we want. And we've been talking about all sorts of stuff on this season. So, you know what? I, I think anything goes. Yeah. So, and I'm going to explain to the listeners a little bit about why. And it's because um, I got caught in a rabbit hole of a story that now I can't not talk about it. So I was actually researching some, a different art crime, but then I got caught on this heist that happened and it was just like unfolding in all of these little onion layers. And I kept going down the rabbit hole and I was just like, I have to talk about this because I'm hooked. So I think that's how that's it should be done. Talk about this episode. No, I'm excited. Um, I have a tiny little bit of art news that I just came across and I really hope it's not your story, story. <laughs> wouldn't that be weird if we gave like an appetizer of what you're going to present on but I don't think this is what you're presenting on so that's like serving an appetizer of the steak, same thing and then like actually the uh, the main course is steak <laughs> yeah it's cooked exactly the same way just in different mm -hmm. yeah just a portion. portions on very <laughs> the first one's on a tiny plate and the next one's on a large plate <laughs> let's do that let's just yeah. do it let's just bring that on people let's have a dinner and let's just do three courses and every <laughs> course is the exact same thing and just see what people say yeah it's like a teeny tiny uh little <laughs> lasagna just like a tiny little square and then a giant slice of lasagna <laughs> <laughs> that would be so good and just act like it's totally normal right i like that okay so whisper your story into the microphone and i'll tell you if it's mine as you go into it if i can see little sprinkles of my story and then i'm gonna stop you <laughs> okay <laughs> just well i'll start with okay let me i'll whisper it um okay is yours about a dutch painting no okay then I know what yours is. I already know what it is. Oh, it's you know what them. you know what mine is? Yeah. I mean, I saw it in the news. So Okay. Well, so it's now I mine. can move forward with tiny bit of art news. Just yeah, you can speak bit. it in normal voice now. Okay, cool. So I got this bit of art news from my friend Jimmy Stamp, who lives in Hello, Philadelphia. Hello, Jimmy. You know, you know him. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a story about um, this is just a quick news tidbit about there's this piece of art that's stolen out of Amsterdam. It's a 17th century painting that's been stolen three times. Three times. times from the same place. And this is a little painting, right? Like it's like kind of small. Yeah, I it's think. called Great. Two Laughing Boys. Mm -hmm. And it's by Franz Hals. Hals. 
mm-hmm. you know, one of those golden age dudes. And yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is stolen last week. Before that, it was stolen in 2011. And then it was mm-hmm. also stolen in 1988 from, I'm pretty sure the same museum in, Am- in Amsterdam. Like how or- bad would you feel as the museum knowing, because what is... Uh, what is the quote that George Bush slaughtered? Lots. I I can't remember. It's like, um, shame on me. First time, oh, shame yeah. on me. Second time, shame on you. Something, I don't know. Or no, you, it's the other way around. You've brought that up before <laughs> in, <laughs> on the podcast. And I've never been able to get it right. Yeah, you never know the thing that he said the way he I'll said never it. Know, and I'll never look it up. I'll never figure out how he said it. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, it's like after, if someone steals it a third time, I know like, what, what is going on? I don't know. You really need to do, or let them have it. They just need to have it. Cause you're not doing a great job with it. I want to understand more about this because it's so easily stolen repeatedly. <laughs> Jimmy did write something interesting. So he sends me this article. I haven't heard from him in a while, I, which is fine. Jimmy, if you're listening, this is, that's fine <laughs> because a lot of us drift and then we get back to we talk again. It's fine. But um, he wrote, look at this recent article on art theft. It's interesting that criminals leverage stolen art to get reduced prison sentences. Maybe you can w- work your way up to private art crimes detective like the guy in the article. I wrote back, that's what I want to do. Millions of exclamation marks. <laughs> <laughs> that was our full conversation. I mean, that would be really great. That would be fun. That'd be yeah. a really fun job. But it is interesting, and we have talked about that, especially during a heist-heavy first season, that criminals do leverage stolen art to get reduced prison sentences. This is a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem like a great plan, but right. I mean, whatever you've got when you're on the inside, you know, I think people use anything. So. Yeah. So what does the painting look like? It looks like... Um, um, it's a really weird painting, actually. So... Okay, I'm going to Google it. Okay, it's really weird. It has like one boy who kind of looks like a man front and center, I guess mm-hmm. stealing some alcohol or pouring some alcohol and he has this crazy fur hat. And then the other boy is like behind him, like right behind his shoulder. And it's weird to me because... His face is... I don't know how to say it politely, but he's got a weird face. Yeah. The little boy behind him. They it's both- not correct. And maybe it's not, I mean, I don't know. I guess no faces have to be correct. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but it's so weird because like, they kind of look like they're not little boys. They kind of look like they're men with little boys' faces painted over their men men faces. Yeah, or the guy, the kid in the back could be an 80-year-old man, just like a little baby 80-year-old man. (laughs) Yeah. So they're very, yeah, it's odd. I, now I want to go down a rabbit hole and understand why this painting is, people take the risk to steal it. Um, I would say that I would not want this painting anywhere (laughs) near me. (laughs) But I would want it if it had, well, I would want it because it would have this crazy story behind it. Like, look, this painting has been stolen three times. It's really odd. It kind of disturbs me. Why is it so popular to steal? Yeah. Well, I mean... But maybe it's not. That's a great segue into the story that I'm going to tell because that's a big part of it. Is like when something becomes popular, it's it just ups the cool factor and the like desirability to want to steal it. It seems. I want. Let's go into that. I'm just going to say one thing. My theory about this painting being stolen Mm -hmm. is that every time someone is in charge of it existing in their museum. They hate it so much that they make it easy for someone to steal it so that it just goes away. It's like that thing in your collection that you're just like, I don't want it. I don't want to deal with it anymore. I don't want to write about it. I don't want it. Like, I'm just going to arrange to have it stolen. That's my theory. Great theory. I love that. Let's go with that. Okay. Um, So yeah, then how does that... let's, Let's go into yours then because now I'm intrigued. Okay. So this week we are talking about a Klimt painting. Oh, great. Which I'm not crazy about him. I don't even know why. I thought about this last night of like why I have this weird like chip on my shoulder with Klimt and I'm not really sure. I think it's just that he's so popular and like people who don't like art will have like a shitty reproduction of his like the Kiss painting on their walls. And so it's just cheesy to me or something. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know why. I want to move past it. 
Because I think I like some of his paintings. Yeah. Maybe you just need a gold chip on your shoulder. Maybe. <laughs> I He puts actual gold in his paintings, right? Yes. Yes. Um, so the story is about one of his paintings. Okay. He was also, also another topical reason to bring him up. He died of H1N1. Do you know that? He was a Spanish flu death. He died at when he was 55. Way to bring this into the context of now. Circling it all back around. Yes, he died in the pandemic um, in 1918. Wow, he yeah. died the, the year it was at its raging apex. Yeah, and he was at like a great point in his career. He was only 55. He was very young. Um, so yeah, and this painting is actually, it was done right before he died. So hmm. it was done the year, it was finished the year before he died. So, wow. Let's get into it. So, it's a painting called The Portrait of a Lady, okay. which is a very boring name. Um, actually, I'll send you, or I'll screen share. We're on Zoom right now. Yeah. We'll do a little screen share action because I want to show you. So, um, well, I'll, I'll show it in a second. Mm-hmm. So, this painting uh, was done in 1916, 1917. And, um, uh, it was in a an Italian art museum called the Ricciotti. Ricciotti. He was like that's the last name of an art collector. Um, so a small museum of modern art in Ricciotti. Ricciotti. Say it again. Ricciotti. Okay. Every time I point, you can say. It. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm saying it the right way. It's in it's in uh, Piacenza. Ah. <laughs> So this painting was purchased by, hi, Pablo. That's Veronica's beautiful dog, Pablo. Yeah, he's barking because Adam is coming back. And I'm sorry about this, Sarah. This is better than the bulldozing sound that was happening. (laughs) Um, It's quite all right. So this painting was purchased in 1925. So a few few years later by this, you know, fancy Italian art collector. Um, and he had it, it's been, it was in this gallery for a very long time in 1996, this, you know, young, wide eyed, 18 year old girl, she's a student. She comes into the gallery. She's looking at this painting. She loves it. And she's going through the catalog at the museum, which has background info on Klimt and his paintings. And she's going through and, um, she's looking at a painting that's just reproduced in the catalog. It's a, it's another portrait of a woman. He did plenty of portraits of women. Um, And so it's in there and it says, this is portrait of his lover from 1912. And it was last seen in Dresden and no one's seen it since. Hmm. That's all the catalog says. And so she's flipping through and she turns to the page with, the portrait of the lady painting that she saw hanging in the gallery. Mm -hmm. And she's like, these look really similar. And so she's looking and she's thinking that they look awfully similar. And so she traces the one that had gone missing in 1912. She traces it on tracing paper and she holds it right over the one that she saw in the gallery and realizes it's the same painting. So he painted over it. And she goes to the curator, to the director of the gallery with this theory. She's like, hey, I think that this is the same painting. I think he painted over it. And the next year, the gallery director was like, okay, let's go get an x-ray. Like, let's put it in in an MRI and let's see if there's a painting underneath it. Because you can see if there are, you know, numerous layers of paint and one's much older. Mm -hmm. So they put it into the MRI and sure enough, there's this painting underneath it. And so they go, so they research the, they research the story and it's his lover who had died in 1912. And apparently he was so bereft and grieving that he had to paint over it and paint a different woman on there. And do a whole different face. Who was the woman he painted over his lover? I don't know what her name, I don't know what her name is, but I'm about to show you. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see. And you guys, you can Google Portrait of a Lady by Clint and you'll see this picture. Okay, can you see? Oh, yeah. Okay, so. So this one on the left is the first photo. So that's the photo that was reproduced and it was like, it's been missing since 1912. No one's seen it. But this picture on the right, which kind of looks like a 
she almost looks like a geisha sort of she looks japanesey to me i think it's like the robe she's wearing like a robe of some sort and she's got her hair pulled back in a bun but maybe not i think maybe that's just her style wait what's happening with the first the one on the left is the original right yes and that's first scarf big giant hat big hair she looks very does she have like blue jeans on no i think it's like a drop i think it's like a dress it's drops down it looks it looks so weird i think Um, she's got a scarf and then like a tank or uh, not a tank top (laughs) i think she's a tank i think she's wearing levi's and a tank top yeah maybe (laughs) just kidding i mean but the the one the original looks so strange yes so that one is apparently his lover that died and then he goes over it and he paints this other woman who still has the same face for the most part glee the same and so what tipped her off so if you look at this photo and we'll post this on instagram or something so you can see the real reason why the the thing that set her off the girl and her name was claudia maga unfortunate last name nowadays but what tipped her off was the beauty mark on the eye do you see like right under her left eye there's a little beauty mark and so that's what made her think like, oh my God, this is the same painting. He just painted over it. So, and so they oh, got those Wasn't results. that kind of, I'm oh, so sorry, but wasn't that kind of beauty mark really popular? Like you could put a fake beauty mark like that on your face and it, that was one of the popular places to put it? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Probably. I feel like there's, there've been numerous times where beauty marks were very cool. Right. And they still are. So she, so they went and they got that, they got the scan done and they release, they put it in the media. Like, hey, you know, because that's that's a pretty cool thing to discover. So they were like, come see this painting. Um, they made a big hubbub over it. And they, you know, were getting ready to do this special exhibition of this painting with this new information. Because now you can do a whole, you know, that's a lot to show to an audience of there's a whole painting underneath this. Show this painting and are they getting ready to show the painting? And... Okay, so I was reading a report that said that the original painting was of a young girl from Vienna that Klimt had a relationship with. She died suddenly. So that's that was the deal. So in 1997, before the exhibition opens, they're getting ready. People are in and out. They're all over the place. This painting gets stolen. It's 10 months after they discovered this thing. And there's a really awesome video of... Claudia Maga talking about how guilty she felt because she discovered this about the painting. She created all the news buzz. And then that's what in her mind caused it to get stolen because if it was never, you know, if she had never found out this cool fact about it, it wouldn't have had any attention. So that's like when you were talking about the reason why they stole that Dutch painting, you know, I do think when something gets a lot of attention, it becomes cool and people want it. Yeah. Um, So the way that they, discovered that it had been taken was they came in one day came into the gallery and there was the gold frame on the roof of the building and it was the it was just a frame the painting was gone the frame was next to a skylight on the building on the rooftop to suggest that like the painting had been pulled up you know like as if they I don't know, hooked some rope to it and pulled it up through the skylight. Um, So there was one detective that was working on the case. And so he's up on the roof and he's looking at it and he realizes like it doesn't fit. The skylight's really small and it doesn't fit the frame. So that it was just up there just to create some confusion about what happened um, because it didn't fit through the skylight. So they're like, okay, what in the world happened here? So they start the investigation And this detective who's on it doesn't really get very far in the investigation. And he ends up getting like transferred to a different department and the investigation just goes cold. A couple months pass. So it was stolen in February. So in April of 1997, the border police intercept a package that's on its way to the Italian, the like Italian French border. And it's, addressed to the former Italian prime minister. And he was like hiding out somewhere in Tunisia or something. And so they open it. So the the, um, border patrol people open it and it's this painting and they freak out and they call the director of the gallery who at the time was Stefano Fugazza. Sounds a lot like Fugazi. Um, Stefano (laughs) Fugazza. And 
he thinks it's an April Fool's joke because it's April 1st, oh. 1997. So he's just like, what are you talking about? Wait, like, they celebrate April Fool's everywhere? I don't know. I, I didn't, I guess I didn't know how widespread April Fool's was. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this Italian paper reported that he thought, so I don't know. Hmm. Good question though. We need to figure this out. But so they race to the border place, which is called Ventimiglia. They go to this place. They drive like crazy. They're speeding to get there. And it, they get they get Fugaza's diary. I guess he kept a journal. And so this report that, I, that I'm referencing right now kind of talks about his the diary entries. Mm, um, love that. And it says, and he writes in his diary, we drove madly to Ventimiglia, but the only thing we came back with was a speeding ticket. Ooh. So this painting looked convincing to the Border Patrol people, but it was a fake. So they could tell right off because the oil paint was fresh. It wasn't the original. It was a just, it was a forgery. Wow. And <clears throat> there wasn't a lot about where that came from, why they made it. I don't know what it was about. Um, but what's weird is that there's another paragraph in the museum director's diary And it's so days before the painting disappeared. So before the heist, he had contemplated the idea of taking, um, of talking to the police there, which I get, have you ever heard of the name or of the term carab, carabinari, carbonari? Is is that something that you eat? No, it's like the, it's like the police in. Oh, wait. Yes. We talked about this in our Italian. Wait, Cause they keep and saying I, it and I keep thinking that it's police. I just no, like exchange it. We talked about this in one of our podcast episodes. Remember the episode we did on um, churches getting their art stolen from them and they would put right. like fake art in the churches in anticipation that they would get stolen We talked about that term then. They're the Italian police. Okay, so, well, well, there's the polizia, which is different from the, my, I'm slaughtering this word, but. Um, Let me look at, it's like, I'm going to slaughter it too, but. Carabinari. That's what I want to (laughs) say. Where are our Italian friends who can coach us? Um, Carabinari. It says they are a military police force. Um, governed by the Mil- Ministry of Defense with the military and civilian duties. Yeah, so they're hard, more hardcore. Yeah, maybe they're like the SWAT team or something. Um, okay, well, there's some other, they're like the police. There's some branch of authority. They're more hardcore, anyway. more federal-ish version of Italian police. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, perfect, yeah. I buy it. Um, so this entry in his diary says that he was talking about Um, going to them and with their permission, pretending that the portrait had been stolen in order to draw more attention to the forthcoming exhibition. That seems awfully suspicious to me. He wrote that in his diary so that he, so he had the plan of, and we'll talk about this later because this is, this rolls into my theory of what in the world was going on. But so just keep that in your mind. He wrote it in, in his diary that he had been talking about this idea um beforehand so and then he writes but now the lady has gone for good and damned be the day i even thought of such a foolish and childish thing Hmm. that's what he wrote so he's feeling guilty that it actually happened and he kind of manifested it in a way um a lot of guilt in this story yeah so anyways they don't have any leads it doesn't go anywhere the detective gets transferred elsewhere and he gets off the case um and eventually the case is just closed and it stayed closed for a long time No one really brought it up. It was just gone. So then this is where the story gets really interesting. So then it was, there was a journalist that wrote a story for, I think it's this paper called Liberta, Liberté. Mm -hmm. It's, I think it's Liberta. Anyways, a prominent paper in Italy (laughs) published (laughs) a story where the journalist did an interview with one of the thieves this guy confessed to the journalist. He remains anonymous. I still don't know who this is, um, but there's a story and you can look up the story where he talks to the thief and the thief tells him that he didn't even steal the real one, that it was a copy that he stole on that day. The investigation remained closed from about 1997 until 2013. 
And that's when the Carabinieri <laughs> made a fresh attempt to figure out what happened to this painting. Um, and they didn't really get very far. But then in 2016, this journalist arranged a meeting with this the new investigator and an art thief that he had gotten to know in a bar. So this journalist is in this bar and he meets an art thief. And what is this like, a joke? A journalist meets an art thief in a no, bar? No, this is this is legit. Um, and he turned out to be this just like gold mine of information. And so he, so this guy, you know, the journalist is talking to him. He's like, okay, we have to go to the police with this. I don't know how he got, I don't know how that happened. Um, so the thief tells the, um, the investigator, the colonel, which they refer to it, um, that, that he carried out the theft. But what he says is that it was actually a copy that he stole, that he didn't steal um, the real thing. And he said that before he had exchanged the painting for a copy, that was when the real heist happened and nobody noticed. So he went in one day, he just walked into the museum as they were preparing for the exhibition. So people are in and out, you know, it's, it's security was very loose. Um, he said it was in November of 1996 that he actually replaced the real painting with the fake one. And the heist didn't happen until February of 97. So the Carbonieri person replaced... So they've been doing this, like, replacing real paintings with no, fake paintings. No, it wasn't the Carbonieri. It was the thief, the actual art thief. Okay, so the thief replaces a real painting with a fake painting without anyone noticing. Yes. Then and then stages the big heist where he takes the what is really the copy, and he knows it's a copy... He's got, the, he's had the real one for months. Uh huh. And so he takes the copy, throws the frame on the roof and is like, okay. And, and now that's when they realize it's gone missing. So the frame on the roof was left on purpose as a sign that like, oh, look, this was stolen. Right. But he had actually had it for months. And he did it like that. Why? I have no idea. Oh. That's just, he said um, that he wanted to hide the fact that it was a copy um, I mean, smart. I'm just trying to figure out what the end game is. If it is even the end, if the end game even matters. I think he just wanted to, <clears throat> maybe what I'm thinking is that, so he knew that if it were to be presented in the exhibition, the fake one, everyone would know it. People would mm -hmm. see it. They would know it was a fake. When it was in storage or when it was in a box or wherever it was, no one was looking at it. So it was probably easier to do it then where no one was noticing. And then, you know, that way, if something went wrong with stealing the other one, you still had the, or the original. Um, however, oh, this is the real part. Oh, so he <laughs> says that if this is what he said in the interview with the journalist, that if he had left the copy in the museum and they had put it up for exhibit, that it would have been disastrous for the gallery insider who had assisted him with the theft. So that means that someone working in the gallery helped him do the little switcheroo. So that was really like how the heist happened was that somebody on the inside told him like, here's how we switch this out. Mm -hmm. And that was probably easier than taking it in some other way. So he says to the journalist and the Colonel that they are going to have the painting back to the museum by the 20th anniversary of the theft. Which would, so, be, which would have been 2017. So, so... Would have been means it didn't happen. Didn't happen. So 2017 rolls around. So he this, pub, this story gets published in 2016. 20, they're, and they're expecting um, it to return. 2017 rolls around. Wait, can, no I pa painting. can I pause you to ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he tells them... I'll have this to you by the 20th anniversary of the theft. And he's able to just tell them that and get away with it because they Because can't. he's doing it for immunity. He's giving them this information in exchange for immunity. And I don't really know all of the details of that part, but they end up, they just don't believe him. Okay. Because like the painting never shows up and they just don't think he's telling the truth. 
And it sounds like a weird story. Like, what, okay, you switched it and then you sold a copy. So what does that, and he's not telling them where it is. So they just think that he's trying to take credit for a really big art heist. Cause that, as we've seen, people love taking credit for this stuff. Right. Uh, but were they able to verify that the one that was stolen was a fake? No. I mean, cause they never really checked on it. You know, okay. I mean, it was in storage getting ready to do it, but they wouldn't have really been looking at it from November to February when they were planning, you know, getting ready for the exhibition. They were, they didn't, no one really looked at it in detail to see if it was. And that's the true crime here. The true crime is that there's like so much amazing artwork that it's in storage spaces, never looked at ever, ever. Like just, yes. it's stored. It has a financial value. It's insured, whatever, but no one ever mm-hmm. even interacts with it. Right. Which is so sad. Yeah. So they don't believe him. 2017, no painting. Boo hoo. He was a liar. <laughs> so then. <laughs> Can we call this you. episode boo hoo? He was a liar. <laughs> yes. There okay. We go. Um, so cut to December 10th of 2019. So that's not too long ago. Yeah. Last year. <laughs> Last year. <laughs> December 10th. Little old Gardner Pete who takes care of the guy. His name is not Pete. He's a gardener. I don't know what his name is. I gave him the name of Pete. Gardener Pete (laughs) is tending to the grounds of the museum. He's just doing his little thing, being his sweet, precious gardener self. And he is cleaning along the wall and he's getting ivy, ivy that seems to have been growing along the building for quite a while now. He takes his ivy and removes it and he sees this like metal panel and he doesn't know what it is. And, you know, I, he is curious. So he removes this metal panel and there's a little alcove, mm. a little recess in the wall. And he looks in and there's just a garbage bag. It just looks like a trash bag of shit. It doesn't look important. So he pulls it out, opens the bag and there's Klimt's painting in this hole in the gallery, on the gallery premises, in this hole. Whoa. Covered with ivy. So he takes it out. I don't know that he necessarily knows what it is, but I think he's smart enough to say like, okay, this is a painting. I'm going to go give it to the gallery. <laughs> um, so he gives it to the gallery. And of course, at first they're looking at it and they're like, this is probably a fake. <laughs> because uh, there seemed to be so many fakes. There was a fake at the border. This random thief comes and tells a story and that there was a copy and whatever this is, like there's probably some weird hoax. So they're happy, but they're not trying to get their hopes up. And they send it off for authentication to see Mm -hmm. like what it is, if it's real or not. What, another MRI scan? Yes, another MRI scan. And in January of 2020 of this year, they made the big announcement that it was the painting. So it's the real how did they, one. How did they announce it on the internet? Um, no, they did like press in Italy. I mean, there's a lot of story. It was all over the internet. Wow. Um, but yeah, so they, <clears throat> so they figured out that it was real, but now they're even more confused <laughs> because like, what the hell? Like, why is it in the wall in their gallery just sitting there and they're looking at it and they're like, okay, it's not that damaged. So what? it's not, it's been not there. that, it's, no, it's in great condition. So it's, which means it's not been there that long. It's not been there for 23 years. They know that. But then there's this ivy that's growing on that door that has been there for a decent amount of time. So at least a couple of years, like it's pretty thick ivy that's on this door that's covering the door. So super confused. Hold on. Does that mean the ivy has some special protective power? <laughs> like, are we learning, like, did the ivy make it so that, I don't know, some kind of oxidation process didn't reach it or? Well, I think the theory is that someone put it there not too long ago. But they like had to go, I, the way ivy works, did they have to like rip away at the ivy to get into that alcove? No, I think the ivy wasn't there. They put it in the alcove and then the ivy grew. So they put it in the alcove a couple of years ago, but not 25, not 23 years ago. But it's been there for like a few years in an alcove, in a wall, in Italy. In a trash bag. A trash bag in what kind of climate? Like Northern Italy seems to me like it would be Northern Italy. So I don't know. (laughs) Perfect climate. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's that's my imagination of Nor- of northern Italy. So right. Okay, but yes, you're right. Regardless, like it should be in shittier condition, and it's really not that. I mean, it's got a it needs some care, but they say it's in relatively good condition. Um, they're gonna get it. You know, all fixed up, glammed up, and they're gonna show it. When you say clam, oh, you mean glam? Glammed, glam with a G. Glammed. Oh, glammed up, clamped mm-hmm. is so glam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. Wow. What? That, so big celebration. They're so excited, and then. No, there's more. There is more, and then, and then, <laughs> out comes these two thieves who are in prison. They come out of the alcove? Just kidding. No. (laughs) They come out to the press, and it's that same guy, the guy who they talked to before, and another dude, and they take credit for it. They say, yes, we we did this. Here's the story. Here's what we did. And they explain that the reason why um, they only went public, they only decided to tip off the public. So they had a string of burglaries. They're serial art thieves. They've been doing this for a long time. Um, and so they said that they were waiting for the 20 years statute of limitations to pass. That's why they waited until t- 2017. And they said that they had planned on, so they wrote a letter um, to the, um, or at least their lawyer told the Guardian that you know they didn't know all the details, but they had confessed before no one believed them. And so they wrote a letter. Let me find this did, were they like lawyers in a past life? How do they know so much about? Well, I guess you know a lot about the law when you're stuck in prison. You learn. Yeah. A lot so of they're things. yeah, and they they're in prison for a separate um, burglary spree. So they said that they were waiting for the twenty years twenty year limitation. They had always planned to give it back. They were never going to keep it. And they said, "You're welcome. Like you're welcome for giving you this gift." Is what they told them. I mean, this is exactly like what my friend was texting me about. They used it as leverage. (laughs) Yeah. They were hoping to use that as bargaining for their crimes that they were in jail. So they were waiting for the 20 years. It's actually kind of brilliant. So they were waiting for the 20 year statute to be over. And then they were going to tell the police, if you let us out, we'll tell you where the painting is. We know exactly where it is. And, um, so they did that. And, they told the cops exactly where it was stored. So the house, before it went into the alcove, they told them where the house was, where it was um, living for all the time that it wasn't in the alcove. Um, And they are not being prosecuted for that painting because they were right. The statute of limitations is up, so they can't. Um, And yeah, they were just using it as a bargaining chip. So it worked out for them? Yeah, I mean, I think they're still in jail, though. I don't, they're not being prosecuted for that, but they're still, like, facing um, charges for other stuff. Mm. So it says, um, it says, the confession was timed alongside an imminent sentence from Italy's Supreme Court. They will now serve seven years and two months and four years and eight months, respectively. And their names are not released, by the way. I looked everywhere for um, for their names, but I can't find them. So they're serving. So those are the sentences for theft and receiving stolen goods from targets, including villas, apartments, and companies. Hmm. So I don't know. I don't know if that's just, you know, disconnected. If they figured out, if they linked them to other stuff after they confessed to this. Um, But they are. So what they're trying to do now is look for other forensic evidence on the painting to see who is involved. Because now what they want to know is who is the gallery insider who helped them do all this because the oh, gallery insider who yeah. helped them steal it is probably the same person who helped them find this little alcove and who probably put it in there. The gardener maybe? But why would they? So, oh, so they said like, we did not expect this intervention by the gardener. This is not a part of the plan. So the part of the, so the plan was, I mean, their plan got foiled because the gardener found it. The 20 years was already up, but okay. They, the gardener found it before they had enough time to actually do the bargaining to get lesser sentences. Does that make sense? Huh. Interesting. But so many things coming in and out of my brain right now. So, well, do they have any leads on who the inside, the insider is on this? Not that I have found. And keep in mind, this just happened in February. 
This is like January and February. So they're still like, they're still doing all this stuff. So I imagine that they probably do, but they haven't reported on it yet. Okay. Another question. Who gets yeah. to have the Klimt in their position, position, possession now? <laughs> I mean, the gallery does. They get to keep it's it theirs. after, I mean, that's true. I just would see there being a bit of a, I don't know, bidding war over who might be the right caretaker for it after this event. As in like they lost their privileges? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm naively bringing this all up, but no, they didn't lose their privileges, but maybe like the Klimt Foundation, if that even exists or somewhere else right. that has like their more state, Klimt, his estate or something. I kind of like, I don't know, guys, like you had a Klimt and then it was stolen, but it was on the grounds the entire time. It was inside the walls of your own yeah. territory for ages, maybe. Who knows? And then it just seems so kind of like humorous the way this whole thing panned out that I could see someone else coming in and being like, we're going to buy, like, they can't take it, but they'd be like, we're just going to, can we just buy this from you for this amount of money? Cause we'll do a better job taking care of it. Kind of deal. I mean, to be fair. So the thieves said that they put it there four years ago. Okay. Which would have been in 2016 so that they could do their big, like 20 year, whatever they were planning. Mm. And so what I think happened was that the justice system takes so long. And I imagine it's the same way in Italy as it, as it is here, that whatever conversations they were partaking in with the government to like grant them leniency for their, whatever information they had on this painting took way longer than they anticipated. Okay. So for them to even get like into the room with someone they could negotiate with probably the years just passed and 2017 passed and 2018 passed and that they were probably waiting to use that bargaining chip before they told where it was and instead the gardener found it and they didn't get anything for it mm. that's okay so i mean it i don't think that it was there the whole time like, I don't think that when it first went missing that it was just in their walls. Right. But I would be mad if I were the estate too. Right. I mean, that I would be, well, and more so like you need to investigate your staff and see. Well, that's, that was, I guess that's part of why I asked, like, if there's someone on the inside who helped with this whole thing, I could see there being interest to get that painting out of the possession of this institution and put somewhere else because- there are people within theirs that can't be trusted. I mean, that's the case with every place, but clearly and now this, so this painting is now it's, they said it's like $87 million. That's like the value that's placed on it. So, and they were what? also talking about because of the, this whole situation that their insurance has just skyrocketed. Like the museum's insurance has skyrocketed because oh, now they no. have to protect this thing. And this shit's going on during the pandemic too. Which Right. Where security is lax everywhere anyways, and yeah, so it's like their insurance is super high. So maybe they will want to say like, hey, would you hold on to this? Because we are we can't really do the right job. So. Yeah, or we can't afford to do it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, their, so their lawyer said that, you know, they're doing more forensic evidence on the painting to see, you know, if there's any other leads as to who was involved. Um, they're not going to prison for it. They won't mm. face any time for this, the two thieves that confessed and, you know, they could have, they could have burned it. They could have thrown it in the trash or into the room. You know, we've seen thieves do a lot of shitty stuff to art. So it's kind of nice that they were like, I don't know what the point is, but at least they gave it back. <laughs> like quote unquote, gave it back. <laughs> yeah. They didn't destroy it. They took care of it to some degree. Yeah. But like, what is the point? What is the point? I do not know. So and, wow, it's, it's like gonna go most... back on display once they finish the forensic evidence. It'll go back up. That's the plan. Huh? Crazy. So that's, the that's the story of the portrait of a lady. <laughs> portrait oh, of do you a lady. See, oh, and you can go. Okay. Do you want to see what the hole in the wall looks like? Yeah. They have video. I want to see what a like, hole in the wall looks like. They have video of them like going and opening the door. You can find it online. It's amazing. Hey, oh my God. This looks like an oven. What? The picture of the hole in the wall, the alcove. Oh, right. Yeah. It's really small. So yeah, it was in there. Wow. Mm -hmm. What was the purpose of this alcove before? Like, what was its original slash current? I don't know. It's got weird little like vents, you know, vent holes on the door. Um. Yeah. So I don't creepy. know. I mean, it looks really nondescript. 
sort of, but very, so I, but you would only know that was there if you worked there and you had found, you know what I mean? Like you wouldn't, no person would know to put a painting there. Okay. But I think it was a director. I don't know. Like, I think we should post a picture of this too, by the way, but like the vent holes are so weird. You only have vent holes in something like this so that something can breathe. Like, so there can be an airflow situation, right? I, what, why else would that exist? Yeah. I mean, there looks, I can't really tell what's in there other than just rocks and crap. So um, I, don't, I don't know what it is. It might be like an air vent. So yeah, that's, that's the latest interesting art heist happening. So now I'm following this story and I want to know what goes on. I, who these thieves are. <laughs> Me too. Um, it's kind of weird that some of these stories that are like now existing in the present day, they, they're like not done yet. You know, like the story you're telling mm-hmm. is not finished. The story about Rebecca Bloom is not finished at all. Yeah. Um, and this story started so long ago. Yeah. In 96 with this just bright eyed little student going in, having no idea <laughs> what the saga was about to be. How much is this painting worth now? 86. 87 million. 87 That's million. That's what they dollars. estimated at based on the last auction of, I think it was like late, it's called like Lady in Gold or Portrait of a, it's something about Lady in Gold. It was mm-hmm. one of his last like huge auctions. And the painting is pretty similar to this one and also has a history of being stolen. But I think this one's even cool. I actually like this painting a lot. You um, mean the one, the original or the one that? Both of them. I don't mind them. I think I guess I, I guess they're the same painting. Yeah, but I like the new one too. Like I like the green, and I like her what she's wearing, how she. I don't know. I think it's a it's a painting that I don't mind. I guess where I don't where I stopped liking Klimt was when it, there's like swirls. college posters, right? College posters, all the swirls. I don't know. But what do you? What you're I, more of a historian? No. <laughs> Tell us about Klimt. I'm no expert on him at all. And I've never got- He was born in Austria. He's an Austrian guy. He worked in Vienna a lot. Um, Born in 1862, I think. Well, what I know is that he started out like doing architectural painting. By that, Mm -hmm. I mean a combination of painting onto architecture and depicting architectural painting within paintings, you know, like features of architecture. But then what he became known for, what took off and what he was obsessed with was just portraits of women. Mm -hmm. Like it's just one after another. Copious portraits of women. Yeah, just copious portraits. And then... Binders. Yeah. And then um, he put gold leaf onto them. So that would, I mean, look cool and make it more valuable. And And it would be very romantic. You know, there's, he's very, his most famous painting is called The Kiss and it's two people kissing in gold. Yeah, he was, I think he was, uh, a lot of people refused to work with him because they thought he was pornographic uh, in his work. I don't think he's pornographic. I think he's just- No, I don't either, but back then. Sentimental and cheesy. Well, sometimes he would show like tits, you know, in his paintings. Ooh. I know, which should not be a big deal, but for some reason he it was treated like such with him. And then, oh yeah, he was really influenced by Japanese art. I know that. Yes, that comes through. I mean, that's like, the, I mean, the painting that we're looking at has a Japanese feeling to it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot to appreciate about his work. There really is. It's, there's a lot of cool stuff happening. Um, and there's, I a, lot, just feel there's like- a lot to criticize. There's a lot to criticize. And I think, you know what I think it is, is I imagine that he was just, he was one of those womanizer like artists that would just completely exploited his like art fame and just had women in and out of his like studio and life and bedroom constantly. Yeah. And this is, I'm being so judgmental. So maybe I should not do this. No, it's totally fine. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's my gut feeling. And that like how many of these women that he were pa- he was painting were like very young, you know? Absolutely. It, I just get a creepy and maybe it wasn't so creepy then. It was a lot more uh, you know, sanctioned by society in general. But I tend to kind of have a bad aura around some of these artists that I feel like were painting all these seductive women in a time yeah. where it was very easy to exploit your artistic swagger i think klimt would struggle in the in today's climate yeah 
Yeah, I think so too. Regardless, I think now when we think about Klimt, it's more about his role in history, how he played with certain aspects of what was happening in Europe, but like was so not a part. It, I mean, maybe he was. I know he was a part of the like what secessionists or something. He wasn't like a part of a major modern art movement the way other artists were. Mm -hmm. So I felt like he kind of stood alone, like he was his own island in a way. Yeah. Like a greedy little island. Um, <laughs> a talented, greedy little island is what he was. <laughs> I'm going to show you. This is... So when I think of like what I hate about Klimt, I'm going to show you the painting that I think of. Okay. Uh, it's this. It's called Tree of Life. Gross. I've never even seen this before. <laughs> I see it all the time. And it's just like... it's. I look at it and I hate it. And... Um, it's so awful. It's like what you would paint at Sips and Strokes or something, like some like paint paint by the glass. Uh, I would never even place. guess this was his work. <laughs> you guys can Google Tree of Life. Klimt. Klimt. Did he do that before he started painting all the ladies? I think so. I think he was still trying to find himself. That's the story of the stolen, of the painted over, then stolen, then given back. Then faked. Painting. Then, <laughs> yeah, there's so many different for, like things going on with this. That's yeah. awesome. A lot has happened. Okay, what a great penult penultimate. Penultimate episode. So join us in two weeks for our ultimate episode. The, ul the ultimate one, which is the ultimate one. We're going to stay in Italy for that one. Ooh, love it. Italy, what the fuck? That's all I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for listening. Yeah. And we'll see you in two weeks. And oh yeah, our podcast is produced by <laughs> We Own This Town, which is the coolest podcast network in Tennessee and beyond. Our theme song is by Patrick Dampier. And then the our artwork is by Saskia Kuljes. It is. Yes. I like that word a lot. What? Carabinieri. <laughs> <laughs>